I'd like to welcome you to this morning's webinar, and I'd like to turn the microphone over to Tom Slavin to begin this morning's presentation. Good morning. Let me begin with let me begin with um, a brief uh, disclaimer, and that is that uh, I'm not a lawyer. Um, so if you need legal advice, you need to uh, find someone who is a lawyer. And the other thing is that the opinions that uh, I expressed this morning are my own and not those of the American Foundry Society or any other organization. So with that said, uh, let me um, tell you what we're going to cover today, and that's the requirements of the new rule, and I will uh, try to provide some advice or strategies for compliance as we go along and then uh, mention some key challenges that uh, foundries face and then what happens if you cannot comply. And then uh, together with uh, Stephanie Salmon, we'll talk about the AFS legal challenge to the uh, standard at the end. So the standard begins with a scope, uh, and this, uh, uh, this standard is uh, for general industry, 1910.153. OSHA has uh, broken out the construction uh, sector in a separate standard, 1950, 1926.1153. Uh, the uh, OSHA general industry standard does not apply to processing sorptive clays like kitty litter. It also does not apply where exposures are below 25 microns per cubic meter. And it also does not apply when you're doing construction work and you use the table one in the construction standard, but that's a fairly uh, rare uh, situation. It's probably not going to uh, apply to most uh, foundries. Now, one of the definitions in the, the standard is the respirable crystal and silica. Let's just mention that a second. Uh, when we use the term respirable, we're talking about very small particles. Visible particles tend to be over 80 microns in size. So a human hair, for example, is about 80 microns. Fine sand grains are 100 microns or larger. Respirable dust is below 10 microns. And for purposes of the standard, we don't collect all of the respirable dust when we sample. We, uh, the 10 micron uh, particles are collected in a fairly small percentage. When we get down to four microns, we collect 50% of the particles. We refer to that as a cut point. When we get down to about one micron, we're pretty much collecting 99 or 100% of uh, those very small particles. When we use the term crystal, and primarily we're talking about quartz, uh, lake sand is 90% quartz. Uh, occasionally, we'll uh, run into crystobalite and foundries, but uh, primarily uh, what we're dealing with is quartz. Standard does not apply to amorphous uh, silica or uh, vitreous or fused uh, silica or fused quartz. Now, the standard sets a permissible exposure limit of 50 micrograms per cubic meter as an eight-hour time-weighted average. This is half of the current PEL, or at least the equivalent to half of the current PEL. Current uh, PEL is a formula that you may recall and is a, really applies to dust rather than uh, the, the silica per se. The current, this new OSHA standard is only about the silica. And there is a, a, um, an action level that's established of 25 micrograms per cubic meter Again, an eight-hour time-weighted average, uh, and this uh, um, triggers some of the provisions in the standard. The standard requires exposure assessment, and there are um, the primary way to do this is through the scheduled monitoring option. So an initial sampling is required. And you have to monitor each job, each shift, each work activity. In other words, every single person who is exposed. Now, you're, you're permitted to use representative sampling where you can sample one person to represent 
others who are doing the same job on the same shift. Um, and if you do that, you need to select the highest expected exposure and use that to represent the other people. If your samples show that you're below the action level of 25 micrograms per cubic meter, no further monitoring is needed. If you're between the action level and the permissible exposure limit, you need to repeat sampling every six months. And if you're over the PEL, you need to repeat sampling every three months. So that's a lot of sampling uh, for a lot of employees. You can discontinue sampling if two consecutive samples are below the action level. Now, OSHA does provide um, in the final standard a performance option, which um, allows you to use objective data that enables you to characterize exposure if you can do that. So if you uh, look at this uh, picture on the chart here, we have a, um, a floor plan. And uh, this is an example where someone has taken uh, measurements and developed an exposure map to indicate which areas are high and which are, are low. So you can use um, real-time instruments, which uh, give you instantaneous readings pretty much, to develop uh, an exposure map such as this. And that's, that's an example of uh, performance uh, options that, that you can use to determine who's exposed or what the exposures are. But uh, uh, primarily, uh, the primary requirement is that you need to account for every employee and every employee's exposure. So you need to keep track of uh, job assignments and you need to keep your data organized because you'll, you'll uh, need to use that. Um, it, one uh, other point is if you do use real-time instruments, typically those don't give you quartz readings, they give you dust readings. So you need to determine uh, what the percent quartz is so that you can um, interpret that uh, dust reading to uh, give you the quartz reading. One other tip is you may, uh, because of all the sampling, uh, it may get very uh, expensive to use, um, bring in consultants every three months. You may want to develop your own uh, ability to, uh, to sample. When you uh, use, um, when you do silica measurements, you need to use uh, a cyclone or a device that uh, determines respirable dust. And if you do that, um, the, the flow rate is critical because you want to select dust that's, um, remember that, the four micron cut point. Actually, um, the, the, uh, previously OSHA used to use a three and a half micron cut point. And in the in the uh, final rule and in the proposed rule, they proposed to change that to four microns, and there was quite a bit of concern that that was raising the amount of, of dust that would be collected and, in effect, lowering the standard. It turns out that in the final uh, rule, OSHA decided that the current instruments already meet the four micron cut point criteria. So magically, um, the uh, current uh, instruments are uh, already compliant, so nobody has to buy new pumps. Um, the, um, it, it does raise a couple of questions, but at any rate, that's, uh, that's where we ended up in the final rule. Um, another uh, final point is um, you need to collect enough dust, uh, so you need uh, about four hours to collect enough quartz to do a, um, a good analysis. Now, you need to reassess uh, exposures um, in addition to that schedule that we talked about. Uh, if there's any, any change that's likely to increase exposures, you need to uh, reassess. Uh, you also need to use a laboratory that uh, uses the analytical procedures that are spelled out in Appendix A. Uh, most laboratories will meet that, but you need to get a notice from the laboratory or a, a confirmation that they use those procedures. The other thing that you need to do is once you get the uh, exposure measurements, 
you need to notify each employee of what that measurement uh, was. And if the, if the measurements exceed the permissible exposure limit, you also need to um, explain in writing what the corrective action is. So some uh, people find it easier to post the samples, which is allowed, uh, rather than uh, track down each employee to uh, provide them their individual uh, exposure results. Um, observation of monitoring is required, um, uh, the, the opportunity to observe monitoring for uh, either employees or their representatives. Now there's a section um, that causes uh, a, a lot of concern about regulated areas. And these are required uh, to be established where exposures exceed the PEL. Uh, you need to uh, post these areas. You need to demarcate them to you know, identify where they uh, start and uh, end. And you need to limit access to these areas. Respirators are required 100% uh, within the regulated area. Now, some people uh, have asked the question, why not just make everything a regulated area and be done with it? It's not quite so easy because there's no eating or drinking in the regulated area. You need 100% respirator usage. So it's very difficult to make everything a, a regulated area. Some strategies that uh, I might suggest, of course, one option is to make everything a regulated area. And then if you do want to um, uh, provide food and water uh, or areas to consume food and water, you need to make those non-regulated areas. So you can have everything regulated except uh, some limited non-regulated areas. Another option is to try to limit the regulated areas as much as possible. And remember that the basis for the regulated area is the permissible exposure limit, which is an eight-hour time-weighted average. So as an example, you may, um, you may determine that a grinding station is a regulated area based on the eight-hour time-weighted average, but the aisle next to the uh, grinding station is not because nobody works there for eight hours. So a forklift may, may uh, come in and pick up a, um, uh, a tote bin or drop one off next to the, uh, next to the regulated area, uh, but that uh, forklift driver doesn't enter a regulated area and doesn't require a respirator unless the forklift driver is, is, uh, has an exposure above the PEL. And then, um, then that's a regulated area. But um, if you may find it easier to try to limit the, the number of regulated areas, excuse me, the, the space that, uh, re that uh, you demarcate as regulated areas so that you have more flexibility in terms of visitors and people walking uh, around. Uh, another option is uh, if you have uh, operations that are uh, temporary or sequential, is uh, to define regulated areas uh, in connection with specific activities. Uh, in other words, it's not always a regulated area. It's only when you're doing uh, this or that, or um, only when you're, um, if you shake out in the same uh, place that you um, do other activities, it's only during those um, activities that are, that are covered. So you, have, you do have some flexibility, but you, you need to work that out. Under methods of compliance, OSHA requires engineering and work practice controls, uh, unless those controls are not feasible. Uh, but, uh, and, and when those feasible controls are not sufficient, you need to use those controls anyway, even if they don't get you all the way down, but if they do help reduce exposures, you do need to um, use those and supplement with respirators. You also need to uh, develop a written exposure control plan. Even if, you, even if your exposures are below the PEL or above the action level, but below the PEL, uh, you need to develop a, a written plan which covers the task, controls, housekeeping measures. Um, and you need to review and update that at least uh, annually. 
That was not in the proposal that came in the final standard, uh, and that may require a lot of uh, work. Let me mention something about engineering control strategy. I think we need to get uh, smart about the ventilation we use, which is uh, which means um, that we need to know and understand the dust sources. Uh, sometimes we um, put ventilation up on a for an ex employee who is ex overexposed, but the dust source is the background or some other uh, operation. So we need to make sure we address the real problem and don't waste a lot of resources on um, uh, on the dust uh, prop sources that aren't uh, contributing to the exposure. We also need to pay attention to uh, mass balance of air. By that, we mean where the air is moving, where the supply is coming from, and, and uh, where the air patterns uh, go. Um, so uh, we need it's very important for when we're trying to talk about ventilating um, to get to reach uh, the ex level of exposures that we need to get to, uh, we need to account for uh, all of the air. We also can't fight physics. If you've got a grinding operations that's generating particles at 16,000 feet per minute velocity, uh, you can't capture those with 100 foot per minute foot capture velocity. So we need to be uh, careful about uh, um, how we uh, how we try to control those. Thermal cur currents are also important. Heat rises and takes dust with it. Uh, the other thing is we need to focus on small particles. So if we have um, a, a floor sweeper, for example, uh, needs to have a, a HEPA filter. Otherwise, um, we may collect the large dust but pass the small dust. Uh, through the uh, non-HEPA filter. So that's a high efficiency filter. Uh, for respiratory protection, we need to provide um, respirators uh, whenever feasible controls are not sufficient. Also, um, while we're installing controls, if people are over the PEF and during maintenance, or task where the uh, where the uh, control is not feasible, um, and of course in regulated areas, when we do um, respiratory, when we provide respirators, we also need to comply with the standard for the respirator uh, protection program. So that's already in uh, already in effect. And that uh, standard 1910-134 requires a written program, requires that you select the right respirator, requires an evaluation, uh, so that uh, a medical evaluation that people are able to use the respirator. Um, now the medical evaluation can be it doesn't have to be done by a physician necessarily, um, but it, it can use a questionnaire. But it's a a screening to make sure people are qualified to use a respirator. And then some fit testing uh, is required. And of course, uh, record keeping, training, and maintenance. Housekeeping is one area that's uh, going to be uh, difficult uh, for us. And uh, this is because OSHA prohibits dry sweeping or brushing and prohibits compressed air. Uh, now, the qualification is it prohibits the sweeping where the activity could contribute to the exposure, uh, but in, in the final standard, uh, OSHA says uh, if it contributes to any exposure, uh, not just exposures above a PEL. So uh, almost it's hard to conceive of uh, a sweeping operation that doesn't contribute to some exposure. So this may be difficult. Now, there is an out here if wet sweeping or HEPA vacuuming are not feasible, and the burden is on the employer to demonstrate this uh, infeasibility, but there is an out. The other uh, prohibition of compressed air um, cannot be used to clean clothing or surfaces. This has uh, uh, two outs. One is uh, if you use a ventilation system that's designed to collect all of the compressed air, uh, then um, you can use compressed air, but uh, that's a difficult thing to design. Uh, 
The other thing is um, if there's no alternative, no feasible alternative, and again, the burden is on the employer to demonstrate that uh, no alternative is, is feasible. Uh, so let's talk about medical surveillance uh, uh, for a bit here. Uh, we need to make medical surveillance available for those exposed above 25 micrograms for 30 days per year. So if you've got somebody exposed above the action level for 30 days per year, uh, you have to make medical surveillance available to them. The initial exam uh, has to be provided within 30 days of uh, hire. And this includes a history uh, as well as a physical exam, x-ray, pulmonary function, and TB test. A periodic exam has to be provided every three years, and that includes everything except the TB test, uh, so that the TB test does not have to be repeated, but everything else does. Now, the um, medical surveillance uh, requires that you provide the, uh, let's call it a click fee. Uh, people in the medical world are uh, now calling themselves click fees the physician licensed health care provider. So you have to provide a copy of the standard, the, the, um, explain what the employee's duties are, explain what the um, exposure levels are, what personal protective equipment is used, and the history of, of the use, and then any records from prior uh, medical tests that happen to be under your uh, employer control. So that's a lot of information that you need to provide to the uh, click fee. Uh, now, in return, the click fee after the exam provides a medical report for the employee, uh, and you don't get to see that because it's, uh, it's confidential information, but they do provide you with a medical opinion for the employer. And it's possible that they may require an exam by a specialist or, or recommend that, and if that happens, that referral needs to be accomplished within uh, 30 days. Now, uh, some people may uh, decide to use uh, mobile services. That's certainly an option. Uh, and those are uh, um, relatively um, convenient. The only issue is uh, the initial testing within 30 days and also the specialist examination. Uh, so you would still have to find a local provider. Uh, probably it makes sense to um, develop a relationship with a specialist in case of uh, those referrals so that you can get those done within the 30 days. The bottom line is there's a lot of information that has to be provided and it's going to require a lot of organization to keep track of that information and make sure it gets provided to the medical provider. Under uh, the communication section of the standard, uh, OSHA requires that containers uh, must be labeled, and the labels have to include uh, the new health effects that uh, are addressed by this standard, which are the uh, lung effects, immune system effects, kidney effects, and lung cancer. Um, the, um, remember that sand hoppers are included as uh, containers, so uh, those would have to be labeled. At the entrances to regulated areas, the standard requires a specific uh, sign, specific wording, and that's shown here on the standard. Uh, note that uh, it's, it's ironic that standard does, or that the wording doesn't include kidney effects or immune system effects, but that's fine. Now, um, this standard requires more than just training. Uh, communication in this standard um, requires the employer, uh, that, that each covered employee can demonstrate knowledge and understanding of the hazards of silica and the tasks that could result in exposure, the control measures, the contents of the OSHA standard, uh, and uh, the description of the medical surveillance uh, program. You have to be able to demonstrate that. Now, um, so it's not just a, enough to provide that information to them. 
if a compliance officer comes in, those employees need to be able to explain that to the compliance officer. That's a that's a big uh, that's a big undertaking. So you'll need to document that the maybe through a test that the employees at least at some point understand uh, the basics uh, those those elements, and uh, if they happen to forget them, at least you've got. Uh, documentation that at some point um, they knew that. Under the record keeping, uh, you have to keep track of air monitoring data, uh, which uh, includes uh, quite a bit of information. One that creates some heartburn is the social security number of the employees. Um, it's not clear whether you can use a clock number and have a reference to a social security number that's on file. Uh, OSHA was pretty adamant that the social security number has to be the basis of the, uh, or has to be included in the record. So uh, somehow we'll have to figure out how to do that. Also, if you use objective data, that has to be recorded. And the, the, we talked about some of the medical surveillance data, that information needs to be um, recorded as well. So some of the key dates, uh, standard is effective in, on June 23rd, but uh, none of the obligations commence until uh, June 23rd of 2018. So you've got two years. That doesn't mean you, need, that doesn't mean you can wait two years, but it, you have two years before all those obligations commence. Uh, the medical surveillance piece has two dates. Um, those who are above the PEL have to be uh, in compliance by uh, June 23rd, 2018. There's an additional two years for those who are uh, below the PEL but above the action level, um, 30 days or more. Uh, those people have to be, uh, have to receive their medical surveillance uh, by 2020. So let's talk for a minute about what the rule means for foundries, some key challenges, and uh, what happens if you can't meet the standard. So one issue, uh, one key challenge is feasibility. And uh, to give you an idea of, of uh, how, uh, how difficult this is, the one gram of respirable silica sand equivalent to an artificial sweetener packet uh, would generate uh, a PEL exposure in a space the size of a football field 13 feet high. So uh, it doesn't take very much sand to get over the PEL. Now when we talk about compliance with the PEL, uh, remember there's probably a distribution. There, there's a, you've got quite a bit of variability in your sampling. And so um, typically air samples exposures are uh, log normally distributed. There's kind of a skewed um, curve with uh, uh, some uh, high samples and the, um, that tail out. Now, the chart here shows that the mean at the PEL, but that is not a compliance situation. A compliance situation would be where your average exposure is far enough below the PEL that uh, there's just a small tail that exceeds the PEL. And in uh, the case of the final standard, you need to be below 10 micrograms per cubic meter to achieve 95% confidence that you're going to be um, below the PEL uh, 19 times out of 20. Now, we thought uh, they might include a 30-day rule, which would give us some flexibility. We'd only have to be 20 micrograms per cubic meter and only achieve 84% compliance, but they didn't give us that uh, break. So we have to essentially be 95% confident of compliance. So uh, for uh, foundries, that means a 10 microgram per cubic meter control target. That's pretty low. Show you how low that is. Um, ISO defines clean rooms, uh, clean room technology and Essentially, we, we would need to be at a maybe ISO 8 uh, 
clean room level uh, to achieve the levels that we need to achieve. So uh, that's a big change to think of foundries as a clean room environment. Uh, so it, it's going to take a, a culture change for us. And, and certainly designs that are common in foundries where dust can settle on surfaces, those are not compatible with clean room designs. So uh, there's a lot of redesign. I mean, certainly foundries are just not capable at this point of uh, meeting clean room type um, standards. Now, um, I want to talk a little bit about uh, respirable dust and, and compressed air. Um, and also about those, uh, the dust that in that previous slide that was settled on the rafters. You wonder how did that dust get there? Well, the fact is that uh, uh, fine dust doesn't follow the laws of gravity. Uh, big dust, 100 micrograms or so, does uh, fall uh, fairly quickly, does follow gravity. But when you get down to uh, one micron, it takes uh, 54 minutes to fall one foot. Uh, and that's in still air. So essentially, that fine respirable dust uh, can be suspended for days following air currents and settling on any surface at all. So for that reason, uh, compressed air just for cleaning just cannot be, uh, is not compatible. Um, because you, you move the big particles, but the fine dust gets suspended and settles uh, and wanders uh, all over the, the foundry. So there's a lot more vacuuming in uh, the future of, uh, of foundries. So what do you do if you can't comply? Well, um, OSHA says you have to use engineering and work practice controls unless you can demonstrate such controls are not feasible. And even where and and if they're feasible, even if they can't get you all the way to the uh, below the PEL, you still have to use them to the extent that they work. So the advice is, is to be proactive in the sense that foundries need to decide what's feasible for themselves. Um, they shouldn't be taking advice from OSHA on what can be done. Uh, it's not the job of the OSHA inspector to tell you what engineering controls. Sometimes they'll be very helpful. They'll offer suggestions, but it can cost a lot of money to follow their suggestions and find out that uh, their suggestions don't work. So what you need to do is um, determine what's feasible, what is effective at reducing silica levels. Uh, and, and feasibility means it doesn't interfere with producing a quality product. So that's uh, feasibility isn't just economically feasible. It's got to be, um, it's got to allow you to produce a quality product. It's got to be usable and acceptable to employees, um, acceptable in the sense that employees are able to work. Um, and it also has to be economically feasible as well. It can't put you out of business. So you need to take control of that process uh, to determine the root causes of the dust exposure, um, document your analysis and your decisions for where those cause, what those causes are, what's the best way to address them, and what's not going to work. And uh, use industry publications. There are uh, AFS has some uh, documents, um, but be prepared to defend your position. And and uh, uh, that's a better approach to feasibility than letting OSHA dictate what's feasible for you. So I want to turn now to why uh, AFS uh, decided to challenge the OSHA rule. And uh, a little bit of background here. Um, OSHA needs to show, uh, for a new rule, they need to show that there's a health risk, that the new standard is needed, and the standard will lower the risk. Now, there is some question about whether they've shown that, but AFS really is not. There are other, other organizations that have challenged the standard that will uh, take OSHA on on that aspect. But generally, the courts give OSHA some deference on the health risk determination. But they also need to show that the standard is technologically feasible, that control is possible, and that it's economically feasible, that the business impact will be acceptable. 
And this determination has to be based on the evidence that's in the record. Um, now, AFS provided a lot of information and uh, provide a lot of, uh, so the record is full of a lot of data that we've provided. Uh, OSHA's kind of ignored a lot of that. Uh, in the initial proposal, OSHA determined that uh, the annual cost for all of the foundry industry was going to be $41 million a year. We provided evidence that showed that the number was actually $2.2 billion uh, a year about the fifth times higher. OSHA made some adjustments in the final standard, but they brought that up to 47 million, which is hardly uh, not much of an adjustment. So the, the bottom line is that um, uh, they didn't pay much attention to the evidence in the record there. A couple of examples that uh, we provided. Um, OSHA decided that the foundries can get by with a 15-gallon HEPA vacuum. You know, you we're dealing with tons of sand, and they decided a 15-gallon vacuum is all we need. We provided evidence that um, we more likely need a two-cubic yard unit with a $45,000 cost plus another $15,000 in accessories. And the final rule, they determined that no, 15-gallon vacuum is still what we need. Uh, for abrasive blasting, OSHA based that on a $8,000 glove box unit. We said, no, for abrasive blasting in a foundry, we need uh, units that are well over $100,000. The final standard, OSHA still stuck with their glove box unit for um, cleaning castings. Uh, ventilation was another. Uh, where uh, they did make some change. They doubled the cost of, of the um, cubic feet per minute. Um, we think it ought to be about double what they decided, but they said they doubled the cost. And then there, there were other things that were not included. Um, um, that um, These are just examples. Respirators, they decided that uh, only 10% of employees will need respirators. In fact, in a foundry with 20 to 500 workers, the final standard, they decided you're only going to need four users, four respirator users in a foundry. So there's still a lot of problems with their uh, analysis. Uh, another example uh, for unit costs, uh, and that's a little bit uh, uh, mystifying, uh, and there are a number of these. Uh, so this is an example of cleaning and finishing operator using a bench with 3750 CFM. Um, and in the proposal, they determined that was going to be about 19,996 uh, annualized cost. We commented that uh, many operations use more stations, larger stations, use more air, and that the cost per CFM is, was vastly understated. In their final economic analysis, somehow the cost went down. Uh, for this unit. So it just, uh, and there were uh, about a third of the unit costs uh, that they provided actually had lower costs in the final than they did in the proposal. So it's uh, pretty much a mystery. Um, we also had problems with the tech, the variability. As I showed those curves before, the target that we need to meet is about 10 micrograms to assure compliance with the new PEL. And OSHA's response is that the unions say that um, that variability is just due to poor control. And if you improve the control, it will reduce the variability. No basis for that at all. They provide no evidence for that, uh, just the opinion of uh, a couple of the uh, union witnesses. Um, and uh, there are another, other examples where OSHA just ignored a lot of the data we provided. So um, they've, they've failed to address most of what we provided. They've um, answered facts and evidence with opinion and assumptions. And uh, so we believe the evidence in the record uh, supports uh, a much different conclusion than what OSHA has uh, reached. So with that, I want to um, have um, uh, invite uh, Stephanie Salmon to talk about the um, 
silica litigation. Of course, we have to unmute Stephanie here. Okay. We're back. Sorry about that, guys. All right. So, um, all right, and we're still trying to get Stephanie here. So, <clears throat> let me just say that we filed a challenge in the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals with the Texas affiliates, and um, that was done April 4th within the first 10 days. And other challenges that were filed within the first 10 days, and there were several of them, um, were filed in various uh, courts of appeals, and there will be a, a lottery that determines which court of appeal will hear the consolidated cases. So um, I think there were seven, ver seven different circuits that uh, received uh, court uh, cases. I'm not picking up Stephanie at all. Okay, yeah, we're having trouble. Go ahead and keep talking. All right. So, um, Well, now I'm going to go over here. Let's go on to the next advance the slide here. Okay, here we go. So uh, the the end game with the uh, lawsuits is to um, possibly overturn the standard, although that's not very likely. More likely is that the standard will uh, go back to OSHA to fix it. But the technological, technological and economic infeasibility are the strongest uh, uh, points in terms of the information on the record and um, the, um, uh, what the courts will pay attention to. So there's a good chance that uh, that will have uh, an impact. Now, it's possible that we reach a, a point where we negotiate a settlement with OSHA. Um, and if that's the case, there are a couple of things we can try to do. Um, remembering that the, um, the stand, we could get a standard, uh, e even if we won at the appeals court, it may simply go back to OSHA to address those questions, and we'll still get something that uh, is going to require a lot of work. Um, so um, some of the options that we're looking at are possibly increasing allowance for respirators. So you could use respirators to, uh, to achieve the 50 and then engineering controls above 100, for example. Uh, it's difficult to say at this point what, uh, what a settlement might look like, but there are things that we might be able to achieve. Uh, but no matter what happens, um, there will be a lot of monitoring, a lot of medical surveillance, uh, training, records, respirators, and vacuuming uh, will be in your, uh, in your future. Okay, I think we have Stephanie ready now. Stephanie, are you there? I am. Can you hear me? Yes, thanks. Okay, great. I apologize about that. Um, 
Thank you, Tom, for covering a couple of the slides. I just wanted to thank everybody for taking time today to participate in the webinar. As you know, the AFS team has worked diligently since actually before 2013, actually even before the rule was proposed in September of 2013. And many of you on the phone today and many of our members provided critical information um, on the economic and technological feasibility issues that Tom just discussed that are part of our extensive comments and testimony that are all part of the record that's really essential for us as we move forward on challenging this rulemaking. And as you heard from Tom today, um, the proposed rule versus the final rule, there really aren't very many changes. And um, despite all the comments and suggestions we made, they did not include those um, in the final rule, which will actually help us um, you know, at the end of the day in, in, the, in the filing of, the, uh, of our petition or challenge to the OSHA silica rule. Um, let me move on then to the timing of the litigation as we know it right now. Um, Tom walked you through in terms of the fact that we filed the petition within this 10-day period. Um, now it goes to a lottery where it will be randomly selected. Um, we picked the fifth because that's typically you know, more favorable for the business community. Um, organized labor um, picked uh, circuits that have been more favorable to their types of cases and, and labor issues. Um, we had the Chamber weigh in and other, and um, the Sand and Gravel Association and other circuits. So um, all those have been sent over to this um, judicial panel, and they should be making a decision rather shortly um, in terms of what circuit, and that will be basically, um, you know, like Powerball, they just pick a number of which circuit that will file into in terms of which ones um, were put, those um, were filed in originally. So I think in short order, we should be finding that out. We will typically um, have to start working on our initial brief. We'll have um, about 45 days um, once that happens to get that together. Um, Tom and I and a few others will be working in the weeks ahead to outline our arguments with the attorneys on the brief. And um, following the initial brief in that 45-day time period that have been the Department of Labor and OSHA will have an opportunity to file a response brief. And that's usually a 30-day window after filing of the opening briefs. And then um, AFS, along with NAM, um, who we're filing jointly with, will get an opportunity to file a reply brief. Um, and once that brief is complete, we'll get a date for oral argument. So we're really looking at bottom line here, um, nothing probably in terms of having a court date until the fall. Um, you know, Tom outlined you know, some of the um, potential issues that were going to be um, part of our, our challenge. Um, and there is always an opportunity to go to settlement um, with OSHA to try to negotiate some better provisions and you know maybe only foundry only or for some other industry sectors in the, in the general industry part. Um, just in terms of the, the last slide here, um, we, you have two years to get ready and I think Tom underscored had the importance of getting started now despite the fact that we are challenging the rule because there's a, there are a number of provisions that we're not going to be challenging and those include um, you know on the training, the record keeping, the medical surveillance, the vacuuming. And um, I just wanted to note that we are going to have one more session at CAST Expo um, that Tom will be providing on Monday, April 18th um, to provide. He'll do some of the same um, presentation here. So if you have others from your organization that will be attending, we urge your participation at that April 18th at 1230 during the lunch period. Um, also, at the upcoming Government Affairs Conference, we are going to be um, going up to the Hill. We're going to be having our big call of action in May, targeting Congress in conjunction with the Government Affairs con um, Conference. We also will have um, the lead attorneys on our suit that will be there, and they'll be providing an in-depth overview of our key arguments that we'll be making in our silica brief. 
Um, and then on day two, we'll be going up to the Hill and pre-schedule meetings with your members of Congress. So we are going to be coming back to you to ask for some additional help as we move forward um, in May particularly. We're also asking for um, assistance in terms of our raising money for our silica litigation fund. As you all know, attorneys aren't cheap, and um, we will hope your foundry will consider contributing to this important cause. Um, I'm going to stop there so we can respond to some of your questions because we're almost out of our hour here. And thank you again for participating today. Thank you, Stephanie and Tom, for all the information. Um, prior to getting to the questions, uh, I have a couple announcements for you. Um, first off, if you do have a question for either of our panelists, please go to the GoToWebinar tab on your screen, go to the Question tab, and type in your question there. Second, this webinar is being recorded, and you will be sent an email link uh, shortly after the webinar to provide you details on how to access this recorded webinar, including the slides and the audio. Getting to the questions, our first question, um, does OSHA provide a definition of silica? Um, yes, uh, and we did cover that, uh, but uh, uh, it's uh, quartz, cristobalite, and tritomite, those three minerals. Uh, but one uh, point to note is that um, if you get a laboratory uh, sample result, often you'll see the dust level, and so you need to make sure that the dust level and the quartz level, are those are two different things. Uh, dust level includes a lot of other material. Quartz is a very hard particle, so even though you do tons of sand, uh, those particles don't break down to respirable size. So in a typical uh, foundry, the respirable dust will be, com will be composed of all oxides and a lot of other things, and only about uh, 5 to 15 percent of the dust will be a respirable quartz dust. Question number two, what are the three to five changes to the rule that the AFS legal challenge would like to see? I think the biggest change is to keep the rule at 100 micrograms per cubic meter what, as it is now um, with some of the medical surveillance and other provisions. But, um, but uh, keep the PEL at 100. That would be number one on our, on our list. Uh, number two would be um, if you use a 50 PEL to drop down, to you allow respirators uh, to achieve that level between uh, 50 and 100. And then um, I, I think some more practical uh, provisions on regulated areas and on uh, sweeping would be uh, would be helpful, um, and some of the monitoring provisions, uh, even though they've provided some uh, easing of it, there's an awful lot of record keeping, and um, if, if we could get some relief on some of the uh, repetitive monitoring, that would be helpful. Another question: Can we use all? Can we use air sampling results we already have for the initial monitoring, or do we have to do all new sampling after June 23, 2016? Between now and then, you can use uh, you can use sampling that you have. That's part of that's considered objective data. I mean, it, uh, the only question is whether the laboratory uh, results are accurate enough whether they meet those um, the requirements that are in Appendix A. So you, you need to get something from the, uh, from the um, laboratory that uh, indicates that, um, um, th that those results are, meet the, the standard. But basically, if you're below 25 micrograms, uh, that's, uh, you, can use those, uh, you can use those results. Um, you're going to be doing plenty of sampling if you're above that anyway. So uh, between now and then, I wouldn't worry about uh, um, using the historical. The historical data is good. Uh, it's certainly valuable, but you'll be doing a lot of additional sampling. 
are real-time instruments capable of measuring to the low values the standard requires? Yes, most real-time instruments are uh, capable of, of uh, those dust uh, levels. What they're not capable of is the quartz content. So they can't tell you whether how much, you know, whether it's 10% quartz or 20% quartz. Uh, so you need to get um, an additional um, sample, uh, or sometimes you can use bulk samples of settled dust, but that's uh, that, that's a little tricky too. But you need to get, and some uh, real-time instruments will have an will do side-by-side -side sampling, where uh, they they collect the series of uh, instantaneous samples, but also collect a dust uh, sample, a single dust sample that you can send in and have analyzed to determine the percent quartz. Is 100% respirator usage required in regulated area even if the PEL is achieved? Uh, well, if it's a regulated area, 100% uh, respirator use is required. And so even if you're below the PEL, if you've established that and marked it as a regulated area, it's, a, it's respirator required. So you'll be cited uh, even if you're below the PEL inside that, inside that regulated area. So that's one reason why you want to limit um, the area uh, designated as, uh, as regulated. Can employees visit a regulated area for a brief time? Only with a respirator. Um, and again, the strategy would be to um, strategy would be to the workstation. If you designate just that workstation as the um, regulated area, an employee can visit, um, or a supervisor can come by that workstation and not step within that regulated area and still um, be able to to function. So um, keep the regulated areas as small as possible. I did not see anything regarding conditionally regulated areas. Was this discussed in the preamble to the rule or anywhere else? That's not discussed anywhere. Uh, that's in the standard. I mean, it's not in the standard. Uh, standard just tells you regulated area is where employees are exposed above the um, yeah. or can be expected to be exposed above the PEL. But if you've got an operation that, uh, let's say, you perform grinding um, on a, let's say you get a large casting and one day you're, you're doing grinding on it, another day uh, you're doing something else to it. Um, that day that you're doing the grinding, that may be based on your previous experience, that may be uh, um, over the PEL. But if you're doing assembly or, or uh, some other operations that don't, uh, that aren't expected to be over the PEL, on those days, it's possible that that's not a regulated area. So you can you can have something that's regulated one day and not another, um, and and so you, there isn't anything in the standard that says you can't do that. There isn't anything in the standard that says uh, that you um, should uh, you know that you should or could do that. But it, it the the standard if you read the standard, at least the way I read the standard. Um, I would uh, I would use that ability to um, make that conditional. Will all current employees need to have the initial test or just new hires going forward? If we're talking about the medical tests and you've already been doing medical tests, then um, as long as all those things are covered, you're fine. Um, if uh, so, you're already in the position of just the, the every three year testing. Is compressed air allowed for production related operations, such as mold blowout? Yes. So OSHA has backed off the the, the proposal was a little bit more draconian, uh, but now uh, they're talking about compressed air for purposes of cleaning the clothes or for housekeeping purposes as opposed to production purposes. 
So they don't address compressed air or they don't ban compressed air for uh, production purposes. So that's some, uh, that's some relief. What does the standard say about employee rotation? You, you cannot use uh, rotation to achieve the, the time-weighted average. In other words, if the only purpose of rotation is uh, I've got an employee that's, uh, or a job that's, let's say, uh, 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 75 uh, micrograms per cubic meter, and um, if the person only works four hours and does something else four hours, and I have a different employee come in, work the remainder of the shift, uh, then neither employee is, is uh, even though they're half a day, they're both 75, but the rest of the day, they're lower than that, and so their average is lower than that. You can't do that. Uh, you can do rest, uh, rotation if you're doing it for other reasons, for ergonomics, for um, employee, for job enrichment, or whatever else, whatever other reasons you would have to reassign workers, that's fine. And if because of that rotation your exposure is below the PEL, that's fine. It's just that you cannot use rotation for the only purpose of achieving uh, the PEL. Are there any special provisions for small metal casters? The one cited here was under 10 employees. They, they um, in the analysis, um, OSHA tried to break out the economic impact um, separately for small employers, but there's no, uh, there's no uh, relief or the medical provisions or the respirators or any of the requirements that I'm aware of for uh, based on size. And we will finish with this question. What is a covered employee? Uh, all right, uh, now I've got to look at the standard. Um, I believe the covered, let me see if I can see that right quick. I believe the covered employee is any employee that's uh, above uh, 25 um, micrograms per cubic, above the action level. I think that's what they talk about as covered. Um, I don't see I don't see it right off in the definition. So I, there is a there is a uh, I'm pretty sure there's a definition for that. But that's my understanding is um, those above the action level are covered. Let's finish up with this question, Tom, instead. How much of a collective effort is there among other industries, including the foundry industry, to propose desired changes that AFS is proposing? Uh, each industry kind of has their own point of view. I think a lot of industries are focused on achieving, on getting the 100 micrograms as a safe level. That's, uh, you know, if, if you look at uh, historically, that certainly seems to be a protective uh, uh, level. So I think that's where the most focus is on, is, is getting uh, the 100 micrograms. Um, different industries, the construction industry has different issues than uh, foundries and other, uh, uh, the fracking people have an, uh, different uh, issues as well. But I think uh, a couple of the uh, issues that we talked about using respirators, for example, between 50 and 100. I think most um, industries would be uh, with us on that. We attempted to answer as many questions as we could, uh, understanding the limited time that people have available. Uh, we will work to answer the questions that we weren't able to address during the webinar over the next few days. I would urge anyone attending the CAS Expo to sit in on the session on Monday, April 18th at 12.30 to discuss the overview of the silica rulemaking. Tom will be there in person to give the presentation and you can ask him questions directly at that point. I also will remind you that we will be sending out an email with a link to the recorded version of this webinar as well as the slides so you can review this information in your own time. And to reiterate the comments of Stephanie Salmon about the AFS legal challenge to the silica rule, AFS has set up a web page to take industry contributions to support this legal challenge. Please visit the website afsinc.org slash silica to be able to contribute to the legal challenge via a credit card.
This link will also be provided to you in the email that goes out, uh, providing you the link to the webinar, the recorded webinar from today. We realize there's a significant amount of information in this material, so feel free if you do have questions to reach out to AFS so we can provide some answers to you. Thank you to everyone for your time this morning. We look forward to serving you in the future and continue to work with you on the new silica rule.